Last week we were finished with paragraph 7 as we're in the book Harmony of the Gospels and Restoring the Jewishness of the New Covenant. It's kind of a dual teaching. If you missed last week, uh, you'll have to go back through and read. And one of the um, uh, beautiful pictures of the story of uh, the visit of Miriam to Elizabeth. You may know her as Mary. Uh, nobody else at the time knew her as Mary. They all knew her as Miriam. And uh, we need to understand that the life and times of Yeshua were the life and times of a Jewish man in a Jewish city talking to Jewish people. These books were written by Jewish authors. And so the name was Miriam, and it's still a wonderful, fabulous name today, as, as, as beautiful as it was at the time of Miriam with uh, uh, Moses. And uh, it's still a name of honor and integrity in the kingdom. And so as we read, we've been reading along in the book of Luke uh, as we take a look, as we look at the, we're, we're finishing through the genealogy, and uh, this part of it isn't so much a harmony of the Gospels it is, as it is taking a look at the genealogy and the two specific views uh, of the account of the birth of Messiah and the coming into fulfillment of, here you go, the last Old Testament prophet. See, John was in the line of the last Old Testament prophets, and because of that, all the prophets to come after that were not really connected to the Old Testament fulfillment. They were in the New Covenant, and John was kind of like that transitional prophet that was fulfilling as the Elijah, not Elijah, but in the spirit of in the power of Elijah. He was the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophets. Well, why would an Old Testament prophet be there in the New Covenant? Well, because that is a part of the New Covenant. You see, God didn't change the wording of the Bible. He changed the condition in which you would have access to the kingdom of heaven. So the Bible didn't get changed when this New Covenant came along, right? Bible's still the Bible. The Torah's still the Torah. All these books are still these books. All the words haven't changed because it was a new covenant. It was a fulfillment of an Old Testament prophecy in Jeremiah where God says, Behold, I will make a new covenant with you. He didn't say, I'm going to change the words. He just said, Here's the new way to access to the kingdom of heaven. I will fulfill my old covenant prophecies. I will fulfill the conditions in which you needed a sacrifice to come into the kingdom of heaven. But the covenant, the wording of the contract still remains the same, the fulfillment, the last paragraph, which is the fulfillment of it, has now been completed in a different way, but the terms and conditions of the contract still stand. They've now been completed. It's like when we paid off our mortgage, we met the conditions of it. Well, now we have access to it, but we still have the benefit of this place. Just because we paid off the mortgage doesn't mean we give up this building and we give up this the contents of this building. We still have the Word of God. And so in order to make this transition smooth, God in His infinite wisdom shows us the likeness of an Old Testament prophet in the New Covenant. And it's a beautiful picture of who John was. And John was kind of old world, old school prophet. As a matter of fact, he separated himself from the Pharisees and the Sadducees because he didn't fit with them. Why? Because he was a really a model of the Old Testament prophet, the last Old Testament prophet. He just happens to be in the New Testament. Isn't that kind of interesting that in the New Testament there would be an Old Testament prophet? Well, because it's an Old Testament prophecy that has to be fulfilled, and an Old Testament prophet has to declare it. <clears throat> well, none of the Old Testament prophets were alive. Isaiah, what, died 130 years or so before that time. So somebody had to be born to come in to carry the message forward in the name of or in the line of an Old Testament prophet. You see, Messiah couldn't come without Elijah or an Elijah declaring it. So how do you resurrect Elijah? Well, you can't resurrect him to walk on the face of the earth all right, until the Messiah actually comes in his return. So you send someone in the spirit and the power of an Elijah, of Elijah, and you declare that. So he's coming with the voice. He was the last one to speak the words of God. You see, the Old Testament prophets were Navaim, messengers of God. They spoke the words of God. Once you get past John, do you find anybody who's speaking the words of God? Correct, but not as a prophet. He was God. It's as if God, he and God were one. Okay? So he was like a prophet. He was the fulfillment of what Moses said. One will come after me who is like me, meaning he speaks for God. Moses spoke for God. All right? And you are to do everything he tells you. Otherwise, you will be cut off from your people. And I explained to you very clearly, your people means the patriarchs. 
Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they're very much referred to as alive, aren't they, when he talks about the God of the living, not the God of the dead. So to be cut off from the patriarchs, the patriarchs are where? They're alive in heaven. They're there. We saw this reference in, in, the, uh, in the New Covenant of the living God. And so we want to be very clear about what this is. So when we take a look in Luke chapter 1 and verses 57 to 80, cross-referencing to paragraph 8 uh, in the Harmony of the Gospels, the birth and childhood of the Baptist, of the immerser in his desert life. We know that based on the timing of Zechariah's temple service, John would likely have been born around the 15th of Nisan, Passover. In Jewish tradition, a male child is given his name on the eighth day, the day of circumcision under the law of Moses. Typically, at that time, a son was named after his father. John would have been named Zacharias, Ben Zacharias. Today, a Jewish child is often named after a deceased relative, and I shared that with you. Now, depending on the part of Judaism you come from, whether or not Eastern Europe, we don't have juniors, but the Sephardic, the Sephardim, who are Morocco, North Africa, and Spain still have a tradition of naming for the living, so they have juniors. So if you hear Yochanan ben Yochanan, you would say, oh, that's probably somebody who's not Jewish. But if they were Sephardic, you would understand that the Sephardim had, had a, uh, a different tradition. So were they still Jewish? They were. But the Spanish Jews and the Eastern European Jews, and I'll give you some examples of the differences. Well, uh, we say, I say Shabbat with a T, all right, like the Sephardic do. But Shabbos is what the Ashkenaz say. I say Adonai for God, uh, as the Sephardic do, but they say Adonai. And you say, well, that's, you know, where's uh, Lauren? Lauren says, Lauren's from uh, the Midwest, right? New York, where are you from? New York, Chicago? Where? Chicago, okay? So Chicago was inhabited not by many Sephardics, but mostly Ashkenaz, and therefore you'll hear him when he recites the blessings. He says Adonai, and you wonder, who is he talking about? All right. Well, he's talking about Adonai, all right? And this is just a difference in semantics, and of course you know we're not anti-semantic. Come on, this is good material. This is good stuff, right? All right, so today today a Jewish child is often named after a deceased relative. Having been told by the angel what to name her son, Elizabeth tells those present that his name will be John or Yochanan in Hebrew, meaning grace. And so as we read it in the English, here's what we're reading about in John 1, 57 to 80 from the Tree of Life version of the Bible. And so as we read uh, uh, chapter 1, uh, beginning in verse 57, Upon Elizabeth's full term to deliver, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard how Adonai had shown her great mercy, and they began to rejoice with her. Now on the eighth day they came time to circumcise the child, and they kept trying to call him by his father's name, Zechariah. But his mother declared, No, he will be called John. But they said to her, No one among your relatives is called by this name. So they began making signs to his father as to what he wanted him named. Asking for a small tablet, he wrote, John is his name. They were all astonished. And his mouth was immediately unlocked as well as his tongue, and he began to speak, praising God. Fear came upon, came on all of those who lived around them, and all these matters were talked about throughout the hill country of Judah. Everyone who heard pondered these things in their hearts, saying, What then would this child become for the hand of Adonai was on them? So we know that through the declaration, through uh, uh, Zechariah confirming that his name would be John, that they knew in that declaration that something supernatural happened to him, which was why he was mute. Immediately upon declaring that, his tongue was loosed because of his obedience. See, his disbelief caused him to have his tongue cleaved to the roof of his mouth and not be able to speak but his obedience because he did what was required of him. Remember, we hear those words, to whom much is given, much is required. Right? If you'll be faithful with the little things, I will make you master over much. All these things are fulfilled, and when we connect the dots, we see how this, how this comes to pass. So we know that his name was Yochanan in Hebrew, meaning grace. This raises concern with those present who protest the naming and appeal to Zacharias uh, by, by making signs to him. Apparently, he had been smitten both deaf and dumb. 
Uh, Zechariah confirms that the child has been named John by writing this on a tablet. This act of obedience serves to release Zechariah from his affliction placed upon him because of unbelief. This moves the people present and those in the surrounding area of Judea to believe that something supernatural had happened to him when he was doing his business. They came to think that this son was born to fulfill a special calling. And so immediately upon being filled with the Holy Spirit, so his tongue comes back to him, his voice comes back to him, but also he becomes filled with the Ruach HaKodesh. And so he was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. And see, this was important because this was exactly the condition under which Eldad and Medad, if you remember going back to the book of Numbers, we know when the spirit was taken off of Moses, not taken off of Moses, but taken off, uh, the spirit that was on Moses was given to the 70, that Eldad and Medad were prophesying in the camp because they were filled with the spirit. The same spirit that Moses prayed would be available to everyone now became available to Zechariah. The very first words out of his mouth after he declared that this would be the name of his son would be Yochanan, he then began to prophesy. And here's what he prophesied. He said, Blessed be Adonai, God of Israel, for he has looked after his people and brought them redemption. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, just as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophet from ages past. Salvation, Yeshua from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. So he shows mercy to our fathers and remembers his holy covenant, the vow which he swore to Abraham, our father, to grant us, rescued fearlessly from the hand of our enemies to serve him in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called a prophet of Elyon, for you will go before Adonai to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people through removal of sins. Through our God's heart of mercy, the sunrise from on high will come upon us, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet in the way of shalom. Pretty powerful. He makes reference to the Davidic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, and the new covenant. Yes, Earl. Uh, back up in 65, why was there fear all around those who dwelt around them? What fear was there? You're not talking about kind of they're not, not talking about fear like afraid. We're talking about fear, reverent awe. Okay, and remember that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. This isn't whoa, whoa, I'm afraid of God. It's like I'm in awe. I'm awestruck over the power and the glory and the greatness of God. And so this isn't the fear we're talking about of being afraid. He did not give you a spirit of fear, right? Okay, but he did give you wanted you to stand in reverent awe. This is what we try to do here on Friday nights as I share with you about worship. Worship, bowing down before God, is reverent fear. Awe of the great, and not awes, the great and powerful awes, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, but, but to fear uh, uh, in reverent awe of the majesty of God. For those of you that really understand what it's like to come into the presence of the Lord, to be humbled by the fact that access is granted each and every one of us through the shed blood of one to pave the way. And to walk boldly into the presence of the Lord, upright and proud, is tempting something that I have no, no desire to tempt. None of us got there on our own. A life was given based on the Levitical, the Mosaic Covenant, had to shed blood for that in order for us to receive our atonement, for our atonement to be made. And so when we humble ourselves and we bow down low because we're getting ready to enter into the presence of God, and I'm talking about the manifest presence. I'm talking about, you talk about the glory of God coming upon you. You know, many come into my office and ask me about the rapture. Are we going to be taken up? When I came to the Lord, I got taken up. I was completely transformed. I don't know if it was my personal or what the fulfillment of this concept, but let me tell you something. I was taken into a different place, and I was returned back to earth a different person. And even if it was two feet off the ground or 2,000 feet, I have no idea. But he met me right there and brought me back somebody new, completely new, completely transformed. And so there's a lot of different interpretation, a lot of different ways about this. But an encounter with the Holy One of Israel is an encounter with the Holy One of Israel. It will change you forever. 
And if it's never happened to you, I pray that it will because it's an amazing transformation. You never walk any closer with the Lord than you walk through the walk you take with Yeshua. And so for that reason, we, we see that now Zechariah, who was a priest, who was part of a priestly order, now is prophetic. Why? Because he's filled with the Holy Spirit. He's now in the pattern of the 70 that were there with Moses. This is a fulfillment. This is what is to come in Acts chapter 2. This is what is to come to be available to everyone. Because what's he declaring? He's declaring his faith in Yeshua. Salvation. He's saying in this prophecy that that uh, just as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ages past, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. So he shows mercy to our fathers and remembers his covenant, the vow which he swore to Abraham, our father, to grant us, rescued fearlessly from the hand of our enemies and to serve him. And you, child, will be called a prophet of El Yon, for you will go before Adonai to prepare his way, like one crying in the desert, prepare you the way of the Lord from the prophet Isaiah. Understanding the prophet, the prophet Isaiah is a contemporary prophet. It was just 130 years before that Isaiah was prophesying. How many of you have ever quoted Mark Twain or Charles Dickens or Abraham Lincoln or George Washington? Well, these were contemporary in our modern history. Isaiah was a contemporary in the modern history of Israel. People were quoting him. And so when you see this declaration made in the words of Isaiah, that God is speaking again through a prophet, a Navaim. And he's preparing the way of the Lord. This is the prophetic word. Now, where do we last see this real prophecy take place in prophesying over a child? You may think, oh, well, about Hannah and, and uh, Samuel, and you may think, uh, let's go back before that, back before that, back before that. Oh, let's take a look at the patriarchs. As Jacob called his sons before him and declared the prophetic nature of where they would be and who they would be, and we see the Bible shows us that every one of those prophetic words spoken over those children was fulfilled, and it was fulfilled because of their name. He knew at their birth when he named them what they would become, and they lived up or down to their name as the case may be. Many of you have shared with me that you named your child, and had you known what you named your child, you would have known what, if you really knew the meaning of the name, you would have either known what to expect or you might not have named them that because you opened up a can of worms. We have uh, friends of ours in Atlanta that named their child Haley. And what did that turn out to be? What did that name mean, Laura? What's that? She lived up to her name. We know another Haley that lived up to her name. That doesn't mean all Haley's will live up to their name, but, you know, if you uh, don't guide and lead your children and you speak that into their life, there's many things that will happen based on their name. Now, it's interesting that my name, Avraham, meant father of many, and I have no biological children. But take a look around you. Take a look at the size of our flock okay, and who I shepherd. And so you see that God knows and what God proclaims and ordains shall come to pass. So John is to be a prophet of the Most High and will go before the Lord to prepare his way to proclaim the forgiveness of sins through repentance and turning back to God. In verses 72 and 73, the meanings of the name of Zechariah and Elizabeth are played out. You remember their names? God remembers his holy covenant and the oath which he swore to Abraham. And so their names are fulfilled as well in the birth of their son. In the first, first eight verses of Luke 1, 67 to 80, Zechariah focuses on the Messiah. And then in verses 76 to 80, he focuses on the son, on his son John. John will be the last of the Old Testament-style prophets, one who receives direct revelation from God. And it's very important that we understand that. When Messiah came as God on earth, the line of the Old Testament prophets ceased. Now Messiah spoke on behalf of God. From that point forward, Messiah would be quoted, but as we read the New Testament Scriptures, do we see anyone who says, thus says the Lord? 
not like the prophets of old. And so we understand who John was. Verse 78 makes reference to sunrise from on high, referring to Malachi's title for the Messiah in Malachi 4 and 2. How many have had their uh, Old Covenant scriptures with them? Look up Malachi 4 and 2 for me because I don't have my Bible with me with the... Uh, who's got Malachi 4 and 2? Won't be in there. Won't be in your tree of life. Who's got it? Anybody got it? Malachi 4 and 2. Okay. Zach? Malachi 4 and 2 says what? But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You ah, shall... Okay, there you go. So he says, what does he say about the sun of righteousness? Through our God's heart of mercy, the sunrise from on high will come upon us. This is a reference to the sun of righteousness. Who is the sun of righteousness? Yeshua. And so we know that this was a prophecy that had to be fulfilled, and the reference is, is the Son of Righteousness is coming. Messiah's coming will benefit two groups of people in verse 79. Those who dwell or sit in darkness refers to the Gentiles to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, while guide our feet points to the Jewish people, to guide our feet in the way of shalom. Remember, only two people groups in the Bible. Not one better than the other one, two people groups, a distinction made. Why the distinction made? Because out of the two, he will make one. There's no great glory of God if he doesn't reunite two people and make one new man. If everybody was the same, how would you understand the distinction? How would you understand this bridge of divide that had to be pulled together that was so different, that was so separated, that this wall was so great that no man could scale the wall of division between Jew and Gentile, created by God as a separation that only through the shed blood of Messiah could that wall be torn down. This was for all of mankind. And so this reference of those sitting in the darkness, why were they sitting in the darkness? Because they had to sit outside the temple. The temple was lit, the courtyard was not. And so understand these lights around Jerusalem, when Yeshua declared that he was the light of the world at the Feast of Tabernacles as all these barrels of oil were lit around the city of the city on the hill, no one hides their lamp under a bushel. Let your light so shine. I am the light of the world. All these things. Well, the light of the world lights Jew and Gentile equally. It's a great reference to all of this as we understand the breaking down of barriers. And so as Zechariah prophesies over John, he says John will introduce the world to the son of righteousness that will guide the feet of those who, who are in the light, the feet of the Jewish people, will bring them into their peace. Who was the Prince of Peace? Shar Shalom. His name will be Wonderful Counselor. Mighty one, Prince of Peace, Sar Shalom. He will take for the people the one he had expected to bring them the Shalom, yes. And to the Gentiles, he will bring a light to them as the Son of Righteousness. S U N and S U N. S U N and S O N. So it's very important that we understand the significance of this. In verse 80, uh, which says, And the child kept growing and became strong in spirit, and he lived in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. It said he is to continue and grow and become more strong at an early age, undisclosed. John went to live in the desert of Judea and became separated from the Judaism of his day. And in this section, Luke has underscored his theme of emphasizing women and Gentiles. Remember, we talked about that before, that Matthew was the gospel to the Jews, and was void of reference to women because there was the Makitsa, the middle wall, the separation of men and women, and there was no reference to the Gentiles because the Gentiles were still in a separated state from the Jewish community. You remember when Yeshua talked to the Samaritan woman, it was a contemporary thought of the time. What are you doing even talking to me? And she was half Jewish, which half Jewish in that time meant non Jewish. Okay? Now, since the day of the Nuremberg trials and the uh, Adolf Hitler's regime, you can be one-eighth Jewish and still be recognized as Jewish for the law of return for the right of citizenship in Israel. For you to be recognized halakhically as legal requirements, your mother has to be Jewish, but biblically, your father 
So where are all the confusion? Well, you have man's way and you have God's way. But even today in man's way that declares that the mother has to be Jewish in order for you to be Jewish, you can't be a Levite unless your father was a Levite. Sounds rather contradictory, doesn't it? Well, that's because it is. <laughs> All right, so as we go back into Matthew now, we're going to see Matthew's emphasis is on Joseph and his role in the birth of Yeshua. It's very important as we flip back and forth between these two Gospels. Why? Because we're looking at genealogy. We're looking at the entrance of the prophet and the entrance of Yeshua to see whether or not there's any contradiction here. You see, when we talk about the harmony of the Gospels, we have two points of view coming from two different perspectives. Do the stories line up? Do the stories mesh? Or are the stories in contradiction? Why does one talk about this perspective and the other one talk about this perspective? Is one refuting the other? No. Okay, there's one story from different perspectives. Imagine if you would, as you were listening to a commentary about my marriage. Well, I have a perspective. My wife has a perspective. Guess what? Our kids have a perspective. You might have a perspective. As we interviewed everybody and you had your commentary about what you've observed in our marriage, you might find completely different stories ranging from the good, the bad, and the ugly. Right? Yes? The closer you are to something, the more you see. Isn't that why glasses exist and you take them off? Right? So you understand that these perspectives are individual perspectives based on an audience. Matthew was the gospel to the Jews, therefore the references to the Old Testament, the man side of the reference and the Jewish side of the reference. Luke was more deliberate in his testimony of going through and examining every fact because why? He was a doctor. This is what doctors do. They keep very good records and details. You can't read their handwriting, but they do keep very good records and details. Isn't that right? Dr. Maha. There you go, nod of the head. Doctors, doctors Maha. Are doctors Maha here? No, just one Dr. Maha. There you go. All right. So now as we come into paragraph 9 in our Harmony of the Gospels, so this is what's uh, referred to as the Annunciation to Joseph of the birth of Yeshua. So as we read this from Matthew 1, 18, Matthew 1, 18 to 25, we're still in the same period of time when we're talking about now the birth of Yeshua. So 118, we talk about, now the birth of Yeshua the Messiah happened this way. And so we're going back to this because now Yochanan has been born, right? John the Baptist, the, the uh, child's been born, he's been circumcised, he's been named, right? And he's going to be how much older than uh, Yeshua? How, how much older? Six months, okay? So we know that the Messiah is coming. Now we're going to hear about the birth of the Messiah. What happened in between the six months? Well, let's see. John ate. John slept. John pooped. John ate. John slept. Okay, and I'm filling in all the blanks for you because this is the food processing cycle of a zero to six-month-old child, isn't it? Okay. We have Chloe, <coughs> and we get pictures of Chloe eating, pictures of Chloe sleeping. That's the only two pictures we get. But this is the life cycle of our babies, isn't it? And, and babies in Jerusalem, babies in the Galilee, babies in Birmingham, it's pretty much all the same as what babies do. And so we have this period of time. Why isn't it documented? Because this isn't about John. Right? This is about John bringing in and ushering in the Messiah. We'll read about what happens to John, but now we come to the birth of Yeshua. And so now the birth of Yeshua the Messiah happened this way when his mother Miriam was engaged to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the royal Hakadosh. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her publicly, made up his mind to dismiss her secretly. But while he considered these things, behold, an angel of Adonai appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Miriam as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Ruach HaKodesh. She will give birth to a son, and you shall call his name Yeshua, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by Adonai through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and give birth to a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And what is that from? Isaiah the contemporary prophet of the time, the fulfillment. You see, this wasn't something that was six, seven, nine hundred years before. This is still in the contemporary thought. This is why when these things happened, people were looking for the signs. They were aware that this was going to happen. 
It had just been told to them, and it hadn't happened yet, but they were still aware of it. And so we have an understanding. How many of us claim the words taxation without representation is tyranny? Well, those words were spoken in what, 1776, right? Over 200 years ago, and we still quote those words. It's on our mind as we see situations. When we see Washington trying to pass tax laws and we say taxation without representation, that's tyranny. And we're claiming the words of Patrick Henry, Patrick Hale, Patrick... St. Patrick, who or Patrick Henry? Patrick Henry. And so we understand that this is still contemporary in our minds as we study our history. Well, imagine people walking down the street and saying, hey, is that the one Isaiah was talking about? Are these the signs? Wait a second, is this what's going on? They would recognize it. Why, when somebody came up and whispered in your ear and you had an encounter with the angel and said the virgin will be with child? And you go, oh, this is a fulfillment of prophecy. Were they just all ignorant? No, they weren't all ignorant. We paint this portrait of the life and times of Yeshua as people that couldn't read, that couldn't write. But yet you had scribes, and you had scrolls being written. Yes, there were people that couldn't read and can't write. Well, would you call America a nation that's uh, an under, underdeveloped nation? We still have a literacy problem in America. We still have people that can't read and can't write. We don't talk about it so much but it still exists. Not everybody is brilliant, right? Okay. But we talk about the brilliant ones. We don't talk about the not-so-brilliant ones. Okay. But the life and times of a president or the life and times of a king or the life and times of a prime minister, okay, we can look at the whole spectrum of things no different than the times that Messiah was born. There's a smaller world, smaller population, smaller density of the population in Israel, but still a mixed multitude in Israel, still Jew and Gentile cohabitating, living in the same city, okay? Different sets of rules. You had Romans, you had uh, uh, people from every walk of life in and out of Jerusalem. And so as we understand this, we have to understand the life and times of our Messiah. So Matthew's emphasis is on Joseph and his role in the birth. Emphasis is placed on the virgin birth three times in verse 18, in verse 23 from Isaiah 7, 14, and verse 25 indicate that there was no sexual union between Joseph and Miriam until after the birth of Yeshua. When Joseph woke up from his sleep, he did as the angel of Adonai commanded him and took Miriam, his wife, but he did not know her intimately until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Yeshua. It's very important that it's repeated three times to emphasize not man-made, not man-made, not man-made. Man had no hand in it. Why? Because there was going to be skeptics and doubters. By the testimony of two or more, by the repeating of this three times, something is how many times do we have to repeat something before we remember? It's usually three times you have to hear something. All right, the Jesuit form of teaching is I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you. I tell it to you, and then I tell you what I told you, right? because that's the way things are reinforced. And in this case, Matthew, understanding his audience, understanding what that was going on, repeated it three times in three different ways. One of those ways happened to be Scripture and prophetic so that it would be reinforced that this was foretold. It may be inconceivable in your mind, but Isaiah already said this was going to happen and said, for the virgin will be with child. Let me give you a little sidebar here. Uh, as a young Jewish boy growing up and seeing this on church placards, uh, for unto us a child is born, uh, the virgin will be with child, pray is the Lord. Those are three things, three buzz statements that always just flipped me out. And I was like, hey, if I hear that one more time, I'm just going to, I had no idea this was from the Old Testament. I had no idea that this was the Hebrew prophets. I had no idea as I was growing up. I was thinking this is, you saw this on church signs. What could this possibly be? Oh, I'd see it on TV. And this was just something that until I read the Bible for the first time, because, oh, the assumption is, and I was just having this conversation with Barry Siegel when we were laughing about this, was that the assumption is to the world at large that all Jewish people know Hebrew, all Jewish people have memorized the Torah, and all Jewish people have read the Bible. Okay? And I have the same thought about Christians. All Christians know Greek, all Christians have read the Bible, and all Christians can read Hebrew. Well, because they have the Old Testament as well. 
Well, all these misnomers lead you into a world of misunderstanding that makes it so complicated and so confusing because what was Isaiah 53 to me but a number on a jersey? Think about it. Okay. What was Jeremiah 24? A number on a jersey. Either he played basketball or he played football. These were names and numbers that had no bearing, but assuming that I would know, oh, well, don't you know your Bible? That's Isaiah 53. No, sorry, I don't. Who is he and who does he play for? And so as we become coming to the realities that we're reading in this text for the very first time as a body, in the Jewish context of the presentation of cross-referencing these scriptures in the gospel to their origin in the Old Covenant to see the fulfillment of the prophetic word. So we see for the first time, maybe in some people's lives, the real connection is the unified word of God. That everything he prophesied he fulfilled and he even put in transitional people to move us from one environment to another environment. Like people like John who was the last in the line of what we would consider to be Old Testament prophet types. Because there had to be a last in order to be the time of Messiah to transition us into the new covenant. Imagine how radical a concept this is, is that no longer would you need to write it on tablets of stone, but everybody would know the Word of God. How radical a thought is it that Jeremiah is speaking these words of God that says, Behold, I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, and it's not going to be like the old covenant. This is radical thinking. Well, what's it going to look like? And so now you have this expectation being built of, well, is that the new covenant? Is this the new covenant? Oh, could the new covenant be a person? Oh, the new covenant's just the words. No, the new covenant wasn't the words. The new covenant was the person of Yeshua. The New Covenant Scriptures are the account of the New Covenant in Messiah. And so this wasn't like the Old Covenant. This was a living, breathing human being that was going to die as our atonement, and this was the New Covenant. Yeshua is the New Covenant. You'd say, well, no, 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 the New Covenant's the New Testament. No, those are the New Testament Scriptures, the New Covenant Scriptures. The New Covenant was the Messiah. And this was how we had entrance into the kingdom of heaven was through this new covenant. Isn't it interesting that on that very same day of Pentecost, which is the very same day of the giving of the law, was the giving of the Spirit. And the very same day that the the shofar blast and the tongues of fire and the rumbling, that was what was going on on Mount Sinai. But the same thing happened in that upper room. And 3,000 died when Moses came down from the mountain with the tablets, and 3,000 were saved when the Spirit fell. Because God prophesies, He shows us what is, and He is the God of restoration. And what He says will be fulfilled, and so no longer was it written on tablets of stone, it was now written on our hearts, and the law would be on our minds. How many of you have been taught to memorize the Ten Commandments? Many, many, many of you. Why? Because now the law is on your mind. Well, what law are we talking about? Oh, that would be the Torah. Well, why would you memorize the Torah if you're no longer, the Torah is no longer relevant? The Torah was thrown out. It was set aside. Oh, well, all but that part. Well, what about these other parts? Oh, no, they're not relevant. Oh, okay. Well, the last time I knew a farmer that mixed, mixed uh, his crop and he wound up with uh, wheat and cotton, he couldn't make clothes and he couldn't eat because he defiled the entire field with a mixed crop. Well, gee, that's right out of Deuteronomy. Oh, well, he wasn't legally bound to do that. He, he did that freely. Yeah, well, I bet he won't do that again. Wasn't so free, was it, when he had no crop that year? Well, the wisdom now is available to us without the consequence. Now the wisdom prevails And how many of us find out that washing your hands doesn't spread disease? That's wisdom. Well, that's right there in Leviticus. Oh, well, medical science has proven that washing your hands. Well, medical science does what God tells them. Medical science has just caught up with the Lord. He said that 4,000 years ago. Well, now the American Medical Association and the uh, New England Journal of Medicine confirms that washing your hands says exactly what the Lord says. Well, so, yeah, you can, you can go get the flu. 
You have free choice. Yeah, but as for me and my house, we'll wash our hands. Thank you very much. So we have this gospel being presented to us. And Joseph is to fulfill the marriage vow to Miriam. She has not been unfaithful. This is the way the Messianic plan is to be carried out. And so as we continue in Matthew 1, 18, 25, and Luke 2, 1 through 7, we begin to harmonize this report. By correlating the Matthew and Luke accounts with extra-biblical writing such as that of Josephus, one is able to closely pinpoint the time of the birth of Messiah. How many wonder when Yeshua was born? No, none of you wonder? You all think it was December 25th. Okay, none of you, okay? Well, let me give you four basic clues of the timing, but I will not tell you the time, okay? Because the Bible doesn't tell me, but I can take it by taking extra-biblical all right. The year the King Herod died was 4 B.C., making it necessary for the birth to take place before 4 B.C. Okay? Everybody on the same page? All right. The decree of uh, Quirinius in Luke 2 and 2 was issued in 8 B.C. It was because of this decree that Joseph and Miriam went down from Nazareth to Bethlehem because Joseph was descended from the house of David. Based on these two factors, Yeshua's birth would have taken place between 8 B.C. and 4 B.C. Okay, we're looking at historical events and things that they had to go to Bethlehem. Why? Because that's where David, where, where the line of David. Josephus tells us that Herod left Jerusalem for Jericho in 5 B.C. and never returned and died there. And according to Matthew, the wise men met with Herod. This would have taken place 5 B.C. or earlier prior to Herod's departure for Jericho. According to Matthew, Messiah was already two years old at the time of the meeting of the wise men with Herod. This would mean that Yeshua would have been born sometime between 7 B.C. and 6 B.C. Still don't know, do you? No. Because God didn't give us the day. We can make surmises. We can make guesses. We can take a look at when we think that John was born. Go six months past John, six months past, past Passover, and you may come to another Jewish holiday, another biblical holiday, another God-appointed time. So as we look in paragraph 11, Luke chapter 2, verses 8 to 20, and this in your harmony of the Gospels would be paragraph 11, the praise of the angels and the homage of the shepherds. As we read this from Luke 2 and 8, and there were shepherds in the same country abiding in the field and keeping watch by night over their flock. Let me pull this up in. in uh, all right. Now, there were shepherds in the same region living out in the fields and guarding their flock at night. Suddenly an angel of Adonai stood before them, and the glory of Adonai shone all around them, and they were absolutely terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I proclaim good news to you, which will be great joy to all the people. A Savior is born to you today in the city of David, who is Messiah the Lord. And the sign to you is this, You will find an infant wrapped in strips of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly a multitude of heavenly armies appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth shalom to men of good will. And when the angels departed from them into heavens, the shepherds were saying to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which Adonai has made known to us. So they hurried off and found Miriam and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. When they had seen this, they made known the word that had been spoken to them concerning this child. And all those who heard were amazed at the things the shepherds told them. But Miriam treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, just as they had been told. Now, it's unclear from Luke 2 and 8 as to what season of the year the shepherds were in the field with their flocks. It may well have been during the rainy season, beginning in late October and running through early spring in Israel. Scripture does not pinpoint the exact date and time. It may well have been that based on the timing of the birth of John around the time of Passover in relation of the previously referenced temple service of Zacharias in the course of Abijah, which is the eighth rotation. Yeshua was probably conceived during Hanukkah and born during the Feast of Sukkot, the Festival of Booths, the Feast of Tabernacles. Yes, very important holiday, the day that God dwells with us. His name will be Emmanuel because God dwell with us. And so we look at this timeline as being logical, but we have no proof. Okay? So that would put his birthday at what, about September? Okay. Three shepherds experienced two supernatural events almost simultaneously. First of all, they saw the Shekinah glory of God. And they didn't die, did they? 
No, but they were afraid. The right response. This was the right response. Okay, if we saw the Shekinah, the Shekinah glory of God fall in this place, you know, the, you know like uh, Glinda from the Wizard of Oz coming down a little bubble. No, it's this bright, shining, consuming fire that comes down from heaven. An angel appeared to them to explain the appearance of the Shekinah glory, the first since the days of Ezekiel. You say they knew of it, but they had never seen it. We know of it, but have we ever seen it? Okay, we know of the reference here, but we've never seen it. How long was it from Ezekiel to this event? How many know how old Ezekiel was? How many years before was it? Was it 360? Was it more than that? Nobody remembers? Where's my Bible scholars? Where's my graduates? You're a graduate, seminary graduate, buddy. Amen. That's what I get. So it was a 360 or 630. I don't remember. Close enough. Let's say 360, all right? That's a long time to keep something in your remembrance, but knowing that it hasn't happened since then. But we have things that happened 300 years ago that haven't happened since then. We may be looking forward to it. We may be praising the Lord that it hasn't happened in 300 years. All right? But this is something that this is a visitation. This is from heaven to earth. The angel's message contained three parts. The first part, the one I want to hear when I run into the Shekinah glory of God is, uh, do not be afraid. All right? Because I'm not coming to smite you. I'm coming to deliver a message to you. That's what I want to hear. Because I think that if I'm sitting here and the Shekinah glory of God comes in this place, you know, natural tendency is, whoa, lightning did strike. What did I do wrong? Number two, they proclaimed to him, to them, a Savior has been born. And unlike other saviors, such as the judges of Israel, he's Messiah, Adonai. You see, the judges of Israel were saviors. As a matter of fact, Noah was a savior. Moses was a savior, but he wasn't like <coughs> other saviors. He was Messiah, Adonai. He was the Messiah of God different than others, and this was declared from heaven. And this is a testimony. The shepherds are instructed to seek out the Messianic child by way of information given on how they will identify him. Number one, he'll be wrapped in burial clothes. Oh, you thought this sweet little blanket was something. No, these were burial clothes. This was not the little baby wrapping the sweet little blanket that we wrap our babies in now. These were burial clothes. He would be lying in a manger, not a private home, but a stable, normally a cave in the hill country of Judah. Being shepherds, they would know where the manger stable caves were in the environment of Bethlehem. Why a manger? Because while Joseph and Miriam were in Bethlehem to register for the census, Miriam proceeded to give birth. There were no rooms available to them, so they took the only shelter available, a manger. However, this was no coincidence. Interspersed among the stable caves were burial caves where swaddling or burying or clothing was stored. Yeshua was wrapped in swaddling clothes at birth, pointing to the purpose behind his birth, that he came to die, and upon his death he would once again be wrapped in swaddling clothes. Remember, the fulfillment of the old covenant, new covenant. What was, is, and is to come. This is the pattern of God. Yes, Earl. My two Bibles here doesn't have that wrapped in burial clothes. Where do you find that? In a, a, some That's what Bible? swaddling was. Uh, was swaddling was right. Was, was burial. burial clothes? These were burial. These were strips of burial cloth. Oh, didn't know that. Then a host of angels becomes visible to the shepherds, proclaiming a two-part message. This is a great heavenly host. And the two-part two message is one concerning God, glory is given unto him because of the nativity of his only begotten son. And two, a message of peace or shalom is offered to mankind with whom he is pleased. See, there's confirmation being called in right now. I love it when that happens. They were unprepared. They went to a place that they were unprepared to go to. They found the only place that was available to them, and it happened to be not only were there caves there, but there were burial caves, and so there was an abundance of cloth to wrap the child in. Okay? See, they weren't at home. 
They, were, they went to Bethlehem. They traveled away from their home to go be in the census from the line of David because that's what you were required to do. You were, you were to go back to your own people. And so they went back to their own community to be counted. Right? So they were on the way. The baby is born. They're not prepared for this. Right? So they go to the only place where they can lay down for the night, and that's stable caves. And in these stable caves, there's place to stay. There's stables. Okay? There's also burial caves. In the burial caves, there's a supply of these kind of wrappings. Okay? Somebody dies, you don't wrap them at home and deliver them. You deliver the body. The body's wrapped there and put in the cave, and the cave is sealed. Because of the signs given to the shepherds, the first entrance of Jewish worship of Messiah takes place, and the shepherds revealed to Joseph and Miriam what they had experienced. And Miriam treasured these things in her heart, pondering their meeting. She would later reveal these things to Luke. So it's important that we understand this. All right, one last question, and we've got to close. Remember, we have a no child left behind policy here at Bethel El. If your children are downstairs, please go get them. In verses 13 and 14, it's interesting to me that it very clearly says that the angels said, not sang. We usually assume they were singing. I don't think it says any place that the angels sing. But in the on earth, shalom to men of good will. Can you explain where the scripture shows? Is that God's peace to man, or is it supposed to be man to man, or is it both? Wait, say that, ask me that again. In the shalom, um, and on earth, shalom to men of good will. Wouldn't that... I In the what? Shalom. Shalom. To men of good will. Uh-huh. Is that God's... Wouldn't that be God's peace to man? Because Yeshua is the only way peace can be made. Correct. He was the Prince of Peace. But I think we sort of belittle it when we say... I, most Christmas cards are talking about, can we get all, all get along kind of thing. Well... You know, let me just address that. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, we're called to be ambassadors for God in a ministry of reconciliation. There is supposed to be goodwill. We're supposed to turn the other cheek. We're supposed to do those things. It's, uh, I think, that the message of the Christmas season, which everybody, which, that should be the pattern. That should not be the one day a year. That should be the one day a year you start to act like that the rest of the year. And so that should be the pattern as we begin each year to remind ourselves, I'm supposed to behave like this all the time. All right, so if you didn't behave that way all the time, that let's be a starting point and to continue past that date. If we're going to put markers on a calendar, let's make it the launch pad for some good that we're going to continue to do and not just do it for the sake of remembering a particular day, but make that a launch pad of who we're supposed to be, not just you know, because all of us are ambassadors for Messiah, as if God himself were speaking through us. And so as we take a look at what we say and what we do, that's really the calling on our lives. I had the conversation earlier today with someone, and we understood the significance of being an ambassador. An ambassador is a representative of the country they, they represent, and every word that comes out of their mouth is as if the president and every citizen of that country is speaking those words. And so as an ambassador for Messiah, when you speak, you represent not only God, but every believer in the world. That's why you have to be very careful what you say and how you say it because it is a representation. Someone can size up all of the body of Messiah through you because you are God's ambassador as if you were speaking on behalf of God and God was speaking through you. So it is a very, it's not just a, a, a one-time experience, it's a lifetime calling on you as you walk with the Lord. Amen? Amen. All right, don't forget to come back on Shabbat. If you haven't gotten Passover Seder tickets, get them. If you haven't signed up for the new book, get it. If you need a harmony of the Gospels, meet out there and sit at that table and uh, see Gail at the table. She's already out there.